Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. We have an entire week of great programs coming for you, and if you want to be sure to never miss an episode, you can follow us using your favorite podcast software, including Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, or the Apple Podcast Store. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913. P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And I want to thank Francis for supporting the program that way. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Sam Spade. The original air date is January the 16th. 1949, and the title of this one is The Bumpus Hellkeeper. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Fill it in to uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police from Samuel Spade, license number 17596. Uh, subject, the betrayal in Bumpus Hell. Fred Gillis was a raw-boned poke from the border country. He was a stranger to Bumpus Hell, but he was no stranger to trouble. He jogged his pinto down the narrow main street, not liking what he saw, and reined up in front of the sheriff's office. He dismounted and slapped the trail dust off his Levi's. Then he hitched up his gun belt and ambled inside. He looked at the heavy-shouldered, uh, blue-jowled man behind the desk, and he didn't like what he saw. Neither did the sheriff, Rance Blaggett. State your business. Yeah, I can do it better than that. State your business and get out, he snarled. Red smiled thinly and drawled, uh, I'm looking for my brother. And uh, what be your name outside of Red? Here, I can do that better than that. And what be your name outside of Red? Red Gillis's hand slid toward one of his six-shooters as silently as the sun coming up over the butte. Gillis, he sneered. Red Gillis from the Tonto Rim. That's pretty good. The sheriff's muscles tightened like steel springs and pulled him erect. Ain't no Tonto Rimmer welcome hereabouts in Bumpus Hell, he cursed. That was real good. And then the slap of four hands on leather was followed by the simultaneous roar of four six guns. Hey, wait a minute. The sheriff. I know her in there. Well, who is it? The sheriff is just. It's Mr. Spade. Miss Kelton, next door. Right in the most exciting part. Mr. Spade, now see here, I won't take no for an answer. It wouldn't be neighborly. What is it, Mrs. Kelsey? Whatever you mind, come along. What are you up to here, anyway? Who, me? Oh, nothing. I'm just relaxing with an apple and a good book, I that's all. I don't see no apple, and the only reading matter I see is some western trash. Trash? Now, come on, there's trouble on the third floor. Well, there's trouble in bump as hell. Don't you swear at me. I'm not... I know my duty, and I know your duty. Now, come on, get moving. Ouch, okay, let go my ear. <laughs> And that dandy so helped me is how it started. Effie had just read a book called How to Relax, and it said there that Western stories were relaxing, and that's how I happened to be at home at 10 p.m. writing herd on a copy of Sheriff and Outlaw, rip-roaring adventures of the Old West. But bump as hell hath no fury like my neighbor, Mrs. Kelsey. I left Red Gillis and the sheriff face to face and vice versa, eyes flashing and guns ablaze, and followed her meekly up to the third floor. <laughs> Been at it for three hours, they have. Won't yeah. be a stick of furniture left in the room less than their stop. You speak to them? Get out! Speak to them! You see this lot? No, here, under my transformation. Oh, well, why didn't you call a cop? Well, I wouldn't be neighborly. Hit me, the did. You see this lump? Yeah, yeah, you showed it to me. Put your wig back on. I'll see what I can do. And tell them about my lump. It's evident. Yeah, yeah, put it back. Hey, open up. 
not go back with you if you were the last man on the ship. Hey, hey, open up. Have it your own way. If I catch you without swearing, I'll take your hair out and wrap it you'll hide your body or rot your cheap grip for you. Now you cram out of here before I'm forced to seek the assistance of a couple of flashy. Do not try anything fancy behind my back, you big slob. From now on, you and me is strictly on the cool beady. You on principle. Hey, let go of me. I'm handy, Hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Don't I remember you from someplace? No, I'm only being neighborly. Why did you beat up on kind, nice Mrs. Kelsey? That is a gross falsehood. I did not lay a hand on the old wag. It was that odious stinker, Joe Donegan, who was just left. And you can tell him, as from me, that I'm extremely unimpressed with his cheap threats to rub me out, and that I intend to continue on seeing Mr. Hobson or any other Johns which I care to. That's a pretty good scene. Oh. Well, uh, you better tell him that yourself. I don't imagine I'll be seeing him. You won't. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you, anyway? Uh, just another tenant. I uh, live downstairs. Oh, well, now I recall whom you are. You are that Seamus, which lives on the second floor. Really. Uh, Seamus, we call it in the radio. Seamus, would you care to come in and discuss a certain matter? Well, uh, thanks. Another time. i got to get back to Bumpus Hell. Oh, whoever she is, let her cool her heels for a few moments. No, you don't understand Bumpus Hell. This Bumpus is an urgent matter, which I would like to hash over right now and without further delay. Well, I... Uh... May I invite you in for a straight slug? Well, uh, okay, but just one. Uh, in a glass. All right, make yourself comfy. <coughs> now, say when. Uh, just after the lipstick mark. Here you are. <clears throat> well, now, to make a long story short, Mrs. Spade, my name is Rosemary Fell, which remains my stage name, notwithstanding the circumstance that I am legally married to that barnacle which has just dusted this joint. Now, being as you are in the detective business... Now, wait a I minute. Kindly permit me to finish, honey. Sorry, sweetheart. I'm not the type to jaw about my troubles just to pass the time of day. I'm sure you are. I am an actress. I knew that. And although I'm low in funds due to being between jobs right now, on account of that knothead making a scene in the last joint at which I worked... (coughs) (coughs) Cheap ginger ale. (coughs) Just to show you how the brakes fall, Mr. Fade, Belita Wilkerson, who just happens to be about the biggest talent agent in this city, if you have the time, I'm phoned me, phoned me on the telephone, on the phone. and arranged an audition. Ah. She also advanced me the sum of 100 clams, 100. which I will pay you to put the B on that dog, Joe Donegan, the rat. Now, which is he? Uh, what do you mean, put the B on him? Listen, Sam, that grifter has got a record as long as my arm, and what I have got on him is longer than his arm. Please. In short, I should like him thrown into the can so that I can feel safe to sing on him. Uh, look, uh, Rosemary, so you had a fight with Joe. You're sore. You want him to pay. You want to pay him off. Now, right. why don't you just wait until morning and uh, see how you feel? Sam, then? listen to me. If that knuckle duster remains at large, I will be feeling no pain. Now, I, I know that from my flamboyant manner, you'd never guess it. But that is only the actress in me. In actuality, that flea intends to do me in. Oh, now, come, Rosemary. What? You disagree? Well, now, really, Rosemary. Why, you big pain in the neck. Rosemary. I am drinking my... Be- Pour that back in the bottle. Don, put it back in the bottle. Uh, well, I'll be going now. Only trying to be neighborly. Well, back to bump as hell. Rance Blaggett, the smoking coat still gripped in his hairy fists, suddenly pitched forward like a fallen Joshua tree at Red Gillis's feet. Red leaned over with a thin smile playing at the corners of his mouth, not liking what he saw, and lifted the badge off of Blaggett's cowhide vest and pinned it on his own. Bumpus Hell had a new sheriff. Hmm? Uh, hey. Hey. Then I heard it. It sounded like a man sneaking up a fire escape. I went over to the window, raised it, and looked up. I didn't like what I saw. An overcoated figure reached the third floor landing and stood silhouetted against the lighted window of Rosemary's apartment. He was about the height and weight of that rat, Joe Donegan. By the time I'd rolled out the window onto the fire escape, his right hand had come out of his coat pocket. Donegan! Donegan, watch it! a floor ahead of me, and I didn't want to get too close to him until I passed that lighted window. He made the roof just as I crossed in front of it. The flashes from his revolver told me that. They also told me he had two slugs left to throw at me. The only light up there was a feeble glow from the skylight, dead center. I headed for the cover of a brick chimney just to the left of it. I had two things in mind. The skylight was his most logical avenue of escape, and I hoped I could tease him into emptying his gun at me. It didn't work. I stuck my head out. No shots. 
But he did use his gun. I should have stood and bump his hell. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. What did that rat do to you, the dog? Uh, Sam, Sam, speak to me. Uh, Here, uh, come on, uh, send an Indian to sell his mill. Tell the governor the sheriff of Bumpus Hell is turning in his bag. Listen, honey, you've oh. got to pull yourself together now. Come on, come on, come on. These delirious Trumans will get us no place now. Come on, uh, Sam. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come on. Oh. Oh. Now, do not rush things, oh, honey. Oh, that was oh. quite a clip he gave you. Uh. Yeah, where were you? I was combing my hair out of the window. And he was on the fire escape, not four feet away. Not a very good shot, is he? No, he isn't. Oh, Sam, look at your poor little head. Here now, let me kiss it and make it well. Hmm, wild root. Yeah, see how it gets me ahead socially and on the job? Oh, well now, what next, Sam? (sighs) Rosemary, I am going to the top now. My dander is up. Let's have a moment of silence while I put through a call to Lieutenant Thomas Dundee of Homicide. It took your boys less than an hour to locate Joe Donegan and haul him in, Lieutenant. Rosemary's charges were not enough to hold him on attempted murder, and all I could identify was the back of his neck. But you were good enough to bag him anyway so Rosemary and I could relax. I went downstairs to bed and started Chapter 4. Aha. Red Gillis didn't trust Curly Mallard, the foreman of the Crooked S. Aha. Uh, uh, unique garage, Harry speaking. Uh, Sam, this is Dundee. Yeah, Dundee. Uh, what time is it? Uh, uh, oh, uh, 8.30. Uh, in the morning? Uh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, uh, it's daylight. See, about that, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Donegan? Uh, anyway, that fellow that we booked last night on your say-so. Uh, well, what about him? That was a bad beef, Sam. How come? Uh, You you better tell me. Man was alibied, Sam. When did that happen? Well, a fellow named, uh, um, got it written down here, Hobson. Warner Hobson says Donegan was with him at the time. Who else says so? Uh, Hobson's words are good enough for the commissioner. Ran for assembly once. Did you know he also ran for Donegan's wife? You don't say. Well, that's a real puzzler, Sam. The human mind is unpredictable, Dundee. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I hope you figure it out, Sam. While I was shaving, I fought and fought. I wondered what Red Gillis would have done if such a situation had cropped up and bump as hell. A thin smile began to play around the corners of my mouth as I climbed the stairs to Rosemary's apartment. When I got there, I didn't like what I saw. It was a note pinned to the door. It said, Dear Sam... I have been called to do another audition. If anything crops up, you can reach me at Greystrom 34292. The Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency. Hey, I want to speak to uh, Rosemary Fell. Hello? Yes, I'm still on the line. Who's calling, please? Uh, Sam Spade. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Miss Fell can't come to the phone. Who's in charge there? This is Miss Wilkerson speaking. Yeah, well, uh, why can't she come to the phone? She's in the middle of her audition. Well... Is there any message? Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell her uh, Donegan's out and it's Hobson's choice. Yes? Mr. Hobson? Yes? My name is Spade. Oh, yes, Mr. Spade. Come in, come in, come in. Why did you phony up that alibi for Rosemary's husband, Mr. Hobson? Oh? Oh, because I knew he's not the man who fired those shots at her. Were you there? As a matter of fact, I was. Would you like to hear about it? I would. Well, first, I'd better tell you a little about myself. Now, for the past year, I've been interested in politics, if I do say so yes, myself. Yes, yes, I... I know. You ran for assembly. Come to the point. Well, in a way, this is the point. My wife's a professional woman. And her own career keeps her busy a good deal of the time. Mm. Well, like the movie magazines say, a clash of careers and so on. Mm. That's how I happen to take up with Rosemary. 
I didn't know she was married. And, of course, when I found out, I dropped her like a hot potato. Hot potato, yeah. Potato. And then she started blackmailing me. Did you know about that? I still don't. Well, I think I can convince you. Go ahead. Well, I received this series of threatening phone calls from Rosemary. And I finally decided to go to Donegan and tell him the whole story. Oh, he was as mad as a wet head. Wet head. Well, he said he'd stop her. And I believed he was the right man to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, last night he phoned me. He said he'd had a little uh, little caucus meeting with her and assured me I'd had no more trouble. But no sooner had I hung up that phone when she called again making another outrageous demand. I decided then and there to take things into my own hands. So happens I'm a crack shot. And I knew that I could come close enough to frighten her without actually hurting her. Uh, you were laboring under a false impression. Huh? Oh, oh yes, yes. Well, uh, you believe me now? Up to a point. Well, I'm afraid that's all I have for you, Mr. Spade. Well, uh, I have something for you. Oh, uh, what's that? Look up here. You see this bruise in my head? Oh. Well, all in the game, you know. Touche. <laughs> oh, now, hold it, hold it. I, I only... Lie I... still. I'll get it. Uh. Yeah? This is Rosemary again. Listen, now, I want to talk... to you, cheap ward healer. Uh. If you don't have that dough for me tonight, I will have no other recourse but to smear your fat puss all over the front pages. Yeah, look, Rosemary... And I am just the individual to do that. You may think you are a wolf in sheep's clothing, but in my opinion, you are nothing but a worm. Yeah, well, look. Goodbye, you rat. And rat. Hey. Hey, Rosemary. Hello. Nuts. Oh, wait a minute, Speed. Well, what did she say? You can read it in my report, along with a bill for my services. No, I'm so sorry she had in. You do that, sugar. Hello there. Likewise. Are you talented or just interested? I could be. Uh, in the meantime, is uh, Rosemary Fowl still here? Did she have an appointment today? Uh, yes, honey. I uh, called this morning. She oh, was well, here then. You must be mistaken, darling. Yeah. The office didn't open till noon today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could I uh, talk to Miss Wilkerson? She hmm? isn't here just now. Oh, she she never gets in until one. Not until one. Huh? She's over at KQW cutting a transcription for our new show, Goal of the Girl and Gay. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, Gale of the Girl and Goat. <laughs> uh, don't you mean Gale of the Golden Girl? <laughs> That's it. Girl of the golden gate. You said it, and I'm glad. Well, anyway, she isn't here. Oh. Good morning, Maggie. Any calls for me? Oh, yes, Miss Wilkerson, your husband... Oh, well, Miss Wilkerson, I was telling this gentleman you weren't here. <laughs> Obviously, I am. Did you have an appointment? I uh, talked to you on the phone this morning. Spade. Oh, Rosemary's friend. Well, you might talk. Uh, she'll be out in a moment. Oh. What a distressing business that was last night. Rosemary tells me you saved her life. Well, uh, that's a slight exaggeration. In fact, the whole thing was a mistake. Oh, really? I understood that... Oh, here she is. Rosemary, here's your oh, friend. Sam, I ever glad to see you. Yeah. What's the matter? Plenty. Oh. Well, thanks loads, Miss Wilkerson. I hope the recording is better on this one. I'm sure it is, Rosemary. We'll call you when the client makes up his mind. Oh, well, thanks again. Come on, Sam. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. Goodbye. Sam, what is this new development that appears to be griping you? Uh, why didn't you tell me you were shaking Hobson down? Uh-huh. And who's been feeding you this pile of gross falsehoods? Look, Rosemary, you may be an actress, but with me, your audition is over and you did not get the part. And just what are your future intentions in regards to me? None whatsoever. I'm sorry I ever met you and I'm going back to Bumpus Hell. <laughs> I went back to the office, swiveled my chair into a comfortable position, opened the February number of Sheriff and Outlaw to page 112, The Trail in Bumpus Hell, Chapter 5, Stampede. It was disappointing. There was a lot of stuff about bawling cattle and dust clouds and Flo and Curly standing on top of a butte, not liking what they saw, when somebody yelled, Stampede. Red Gillis was riding ahead of the cattle and his horse stepped into a chuck hole and he'd sprained his ankle, red of the horse, it didn't say which. But Red was lying prostrate in the path of the avalanche of tossing horns, not liking what he saw. Uh, uh, hold it a minute. Let's see. Uh, continue on page uh, 113. Uh, uh, learn to be a private... De- ah. uh, hello. Spade, this is Hobson. Come out here right away. Something terrible has happened. Such as? Rosemary is here, and I, I think she's dead. <laughs> In here, Spade. Oh, I don't know how she got in. Oh, yes, I do remember I must have left the door unlocked. Where were you? Why, I, I uh, just stepped out to get some cigarettes. Did you prove it? Why, uh, no, I'm afraid not. 
I got halfway and found I didn't have any money and came back. You came back, walked through this room, went in the bedroom and didn't see the body until you started back? Well, yes, the lights were off. I, uh, I stumbled over it. This is the gun? Yes. She did it with my own gun. Oh, I never dreamed her love for me would drive her to self-destruction. Of course, now it's clear what really lay behind her poor, clumsy effort to blackmail me. It was a desperate move to get me back. Oh, I'll never forgive myself for driving that poor girl to this. Don't worry about that, Hobson. This isn't suicide. Murder? Oh, great heavens. What will Belita say? Belita? Yes, my wife. Belita Wilkerson? Uh, professional name, you know. I was explaining to you before that... Oh, that's my wife now. What in the world will I tell her? Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? This is Rosemary, for the last time. Who? And I'm just calling to tell you that you have stalled around too long. I have talked to your wife and told her the whole sordid pitch. Why she wants you back, I will never know. But I sold you cheap and you weren't worth a cent more. I am a girl who does not like to do things halfway, but you were just too late. Goodbye, you fathead. Yeah, Rosemary, I guess we were all too late. I called you, Dundee, and then, like the rat I am, made off with your prize suspect before you and your boys from Homicide arrived. We arrived at the Belita Wilkerson Talent Agency just as the boss was shutting up shop for the day. She had the recordings under her arm. All right, Belita, I'll take those. Well, what are you... Warner, Mr. Spade... Unlock the door, Belita, we're going back in. Warner, why are You'd you... You'd better do as he says, Belita. Well, all right, but... Give me those keys. I don't... Inside, both of you. Where do you play these records? The recording studio is just through there, but you can spare yourself the trouble. I admit I tricked Rosemary into recording those blackmail speeches and then played them back over the phone to Warner. If trying to hold on to my husband is a crime. Then I'm a criminal. Oh, now, Belita, my dear. <gasps> Come on, oh, dear. stop that. I gotta get busy. I phoned the Hobson house, and you were still there, Dundee. You said it was an open and shut case against Hobson and to deliver him at once or kiss my license goodbye. But when I told you my diabol <laughs> diabolically ingenious scheme, you said, yes, you'd be glad to because it was a sure way of getting rid of me once and for all. It took us nearly two hours to get things ready in Belita's recording studio. We took the parts of Rosemary's so-called audition records that we thought would fit the occasion and dubbed them onto a single side. We played it back once... Then I phoned you at headquarters. Homicide. Lieutenant Dundee. Spade, Dundee. Everything's ready here. Did you pick up Donegan? Oh, yeah. He's here. Donegan? Hold on. Okay, Belina. Start the record when I give you the nod. Yes, Mr. Spade. I didn't say it, Donegan. That's for you. Nice. Yeah, who's this? This is Rosemary. Huh? I forgive you for everything, but there are some things I cannot it's forget. You Rosemary, love. it sounds like... We have meant a lot to each other, but after what Ro you have done to me, it is time you Rose... stay through the nose. Rosemary, I didn't mean it when I followed you to his house and you went right in like you lived there. I just went nuts. What you have done to me, it is time you pay through the nose, you Listen. rat. I am a girl who Listen, does not Rose... like to do things halfway. Listen, honey, but you're you not going to throw a look at me, are you? Honest, I'm, I'm glad to hear your voice. Too. I thought you were dead. We have meant a lot to Okay, kill it. Rosemary, are you listening? Rosemary! Hey, no, she's still on the line. I want to talk to her. Take him, Paul House. Wait a minute. Take him. Uh, Sam? Yeah, Dundee. Congratulations. That was a brilliant piece of work. Hey. Sam, you still on the line? Yeah, I'll be all right, Dundee. I just fainted temporarily. Say it again, will you, pal? Yeah, as I was saying, congratulations on a brilliant piece of work. Well... But I have never in all my years on the force heard of such a wild, insane, illegal, unethical, and downright cruel method of extorting a confession. Thank you, Dundee. I feel better already. Period. End of report. But, but Sam, what happened? Effie, I thought I had made that abundantly clear. No. In order to discredit her husband's paramour... Belita gave her a come on about an audition and had her play the part of a blackmailer reading lines from a script which she, Belita, had prepared and thereupon proceeded to play said records over the telephone, well knowing that her husband would erroneously believe Rosemary to be a blackmailer in fact and would drop her like a hot spud. No, Sam, no, I don't mean Don't that. interrupt. Oh. It was my inspiration, I, Sam Spade, to use Belita's fiendish device for a higher purpose. No, Sam, no, yes. that is what I'm... No, Sam, I, I meant the Western story, Betrayal and Bumpus Crick. It is not Crick, Effie. You can't say 
H over the radio, Sam. Oh, yes, you can. Bumpus Hell is the post office designation of a hamlet right here in California. It is? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, well, anyway, what happened? Did Red Gillis ever find his brother? I didn't quite finish, Ev. Go type that up and I shall. <laughs> Sam, what's the matter? You don't look at all well. It can't be. It doesn't happen. It's a misprint. That's what it is. What, Sam? What? Maybe the writer was tired. Oh, Sam, it's only a story. That's what you think. Well, did Red Gillis find his brother? I won't tell. Oh, no, Sam. Now, don't be childish. Oh, well, all right. Remember the sheriff he shot on page one? What? Yeah, it turned out to be the new school mom. Oh, how ornery. A woman, huh? <laughs> nice, Sam. Get off. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Welcome back. I'm fairly certain we have never had a plot where Detective just wants to read a Western novel and is reading it out loud and with great gusto, but keeps being interrupted by shenanigans. And it definitely breaks the typical Sam Spade template and does something a little different which works. Now, in terms of this location... Uh, the hamlet of Bumpus Hell, I can't find any evidence that that still exists. However, it is part of the Lassan, uh, or Lassen, excuse me, Volcanic National Park in California. And uh, it is a 16-acre um, geothermal area, uh, and it features hot springs, fumaroles, and boiling mud pots. And this was an area, it was named after a cowboy named Kendall Van Hook Bumpus, who discovered the area, had a mining claim on it, and he went up with a newspaper editor uh, to see the location, and he broke through a thin crust uh, above a scalding hot mud pot. Uh, and had a leg that was badly scalded and eventually had to be amputated. There's a quote from the Red Bluff uh, Independent. Our guide, after cautioning us to be careful where we stepped, broke through the crust, plunged his leg into the boiling mud underneath, which, clinging to his limb, burned him severely. If our guide had been a profane man, I think he would have cursed a little. As it was, I think his silence was owing to his inability to do the subject justice. Now, I hope I've done this subject justice uh, in my explanation. I have to admit that I had never heard of a fumarole before uh, reading about this. In fact, my first uh, attempt to pronounce it, I pronounced it as fumarole, which I realized sounded like a dish you'd order in a Mexican restaurant, so I decided to double-check and... I was not pronouncing it correctly. For those of you who uh, like to visit uh, volcanic uh, areas, geothermal areas, it looks like a really interesting place in its own way. It's about a mile and a half hike, and the National Park Service has uh, a uh, YouTube video on the hike to Bumpus Hell 
section of, uh, let's say, a uh, volcanic national park. And they say that the ideal time to hike uh, is between July and October because the area gets about 30 feet of snow. So it takes a while for that trail to be passable. Now, of course, that doesn't have much relevance to the story. Then again, I don't think the name had particular relevance. I get the impression that they were trying to do this to get something over on the network. Through a loophole. Uh, that's kind of why I imagine they chose this particular episode title. But I could be wrong. I'd be less suspicious if the Western readings included a reference to scalding mud pops. But at any rate, we turn now to listener comments and feedback. And Frances sends a nice uh, Christmas card along with her donation. Uh, and she writes... Dear Adam, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas with your baby, especially his first Christmas. Uh, my best, uh, Francis. Well, thank you so much, Francis. We had a really good Christmas. We had some hiccups, mainly me throwing out my back on Christmas Eve. So, Andrea had to get all of the presents out from under the tree. But I felt better as the day went on, and... We got to enjoy each other and our animal. Just have a really happy Christmas at home. And Elijah enjoyed himself, and and we were just thrilled. Our Christmases are never perfect, but this one was really great. So thanks so much for asking, Francis. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Charlie, Patreon supporter since July of 2020, currently supporting the show at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support. And that will do it for today. A reminder, if you want to be sure to never miss an episode, I encourage you to follow the podcast using your favorite podcast software, including Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, or the Amazon Music app at Amazon.com slash OTR Detectives. And if you are enjoying this podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help the channel grow. Join us back here uh, next Monday for another episode of Sam Spade, but coming up tomorrow, we will meet Miss Sherlock, where... Maybe we can force the lock and see what's in the chair. Oh, no, Peter, that would ruin it. Well, I don't see what... Listen. Someone in the storeroom. There's someone breaking into the chair. We'll see about that. Hey, you with the flashlight, what do you think you're doing? Turn the light off. Look out, Peter! Oh! oh. 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 Well, how do I know? Get this thing off my head. Oh, wait till I turn oh. on the light. Get this thing off me. I'm a stack up, Katie. All right. Oh, still, <laughs> oh, Peter, I can't help it. What's so funny about it? <laughs> Somebody conks me on the head and then throws a sack over my face. There, there. I've got it now. <laughs> <sighs> Boy, I never knew how a potato felt before. Only I was alone in the sack. Oh, Peter, oh, Lord. Uh, Beautiful chest. Somebody try the lid off. Well, now at least we'll be able to see what's inside. Why, Peter, the chest is empty. Well, the costly cleaned it out. But he didn't have time. Besides, he probably brought the sack to carry away whatever was in the chest. Sack me up instead. But why pry open an empty chest? I wonder. There must be a secret panel or something. Now, Jane, but don't But, Peter, there that. must be. Why would all these people want the chest? Oh, I found a little panel right in the side. It moves. See, the chest has a false bottom. Anything there? Oh, oh Peter. Let me see, Jane. In the bottom of the chest. Peter... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash GreatDetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.